What is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Limited Resources. This episode number 420. My name is Marshall. I'm one of your Limited Resources. And joining me on the line all the way from Denver, Colorado, it's Luis Scott Vargas. Luis, how you been, sir? Good, good. Uh, got two exciting things that are happening. One is that the Holiday Cube is up. <laughs> oh, yeah. I have been looking forward to for quite some time. And the other is that uh, Eternal, the, the game I work on, our, our newest set just released, which, you know, it's our third set ever. Ooh. So very excited about that, the Dusk Road. and You put in a lot of work on that yourself? Yeah, I'm, I'm one of the designers. I play test the cards and, you know, try to balance it and try to make it fun. And so far, it's the the reactions from people have been good to see. And it's always exciting seeing people play with your toys. So I, I, have, I have enjoyed that. God, that's got to be really cool. Just as I mean, you know me, I'm I'm a creator too. I like to make stuff, videos and podcasts and that kind of stuff. And it's always cool to see when it clicks with somebody. You know, when they go, I see what you were doing there, and I really like it. And that's got to be cool to have that uh, in such an immersive experience, like a game. You know, yeah, where for, sure. for my stuff, it's like, here, watch this. Oh, you liked it, good. But we, when, with the game, it's like deeper. You know, I don't know. I'm kind of jealous right now. If you can't tell, um, where, where can people find that stuff? Uh, you can go to eternalcardgame.com and you'll okay. find links. We're on all sorts of devices, you know, PC, Mac, iOS, uh, tablet. Yeah, I, have it so. on my, I have it on my iPhone even. Um, yeah. And for people that know Eternal's, uh, you know, a collectible, you know, a TCG style digital card game that you can play. And yes, there is drafting. So oh, yeah. I, I, I will be in the queue. So <laughs> you, you might run into me. Um so, geez, I got the cat on me now. She's just going nuts. Uh, every single time we start the show, you know, she's just like, oh, it's my time. To... Anyway, uh, show's brought to you, of course, by ChannelFireball.com. Uh, that's, of course, the place to go for everything you need magic related on the internet. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention, um, coming from CFB next year, early, there's a bit of a break here. But uh, January 5th through 7th is GP Santa Clara which is in uh, NorCal. It's actually, what, just like right next to San Jose? Is that where it's at? Yeah, San Jose and Santa Clara are very, very close to each other. In fact, they kind of are an amorphous blob of, <laughs> of tech of companies city. and <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, various other things like that. So uh, I, I would definitely recommend checking it out. Team tournaments are fun. We're going to talk about those today, actually. Indeed. And this yeah, is, that one's going to be Team Trio's construct. Yeah, it's a really cool format where you have uh, one modern player, one standard player, one legacy player, but no restrictions other than that. So mm -hmm. all real decks. I mean, these are the decks people would play at any other event they were they're going to play at. So it's not like yeah. unified, which has some funkiness going on. Yeah, I'm going to be doing uh, coverage down there, and that'll be the first GP of the new year. So make sure you check that out. And of course, while you're over at Channel Fireball, you can check out all the awesome free content right on the front page. Uh, if you want to get, you know, I, I like the variety that's there. You can watch Sam Pardee play modern, modern uh, Eldrazi Tron. You can watch uh, Brian DeMars play Ramanop Red and Standard. You can even watch Reed Duke play vintage miracles if you like going old school all of that stuff's up there i'm going to be recording some draft videos this week with the uh, vintage cube i know you're going to have some up as well uh louise so you make sure you check out channelfireball.com and uh we do appreciate their support of the show also the show is brought to you thank goodness by you guys on the patreon wow we really appreciate you sticking with us we know we had a bit of a bumpy ride there with patreon and their nonsense but uh seems like things have calmed down there and uh I appreciate those of you who either stuck with us or came back. We're starting to get back to, you know, somewhere around where we were before, which is really nice. And uh, thank you. I'll, I'll have you know, I did not change my pledge throughout this whole process. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am aware of your unchanged status. Um, now, one of the things that you get for being a patron, among the uh, many others, uh, submitting questions for the Patreon question of the week, which, by the way, I just realized I forgot to grab, so I will grab that in just a second, but uh, is you get your name entered into a giveaway. And, uh, you know, this is, this is, uh, we're, okay, cat, you're out of here. <laughs> uh, th this is where you get um, to, you get the cards from the uh, pack, crack of packs. That's what I'm going for here. So I give away a bunch of stuff. In fact, I've got some other stuff I'm going to be giving away soon as well um, that I kind of accumulate. I've got actually got a, a sweet play mat that I'm going to give out from the World Magic Cup. It's a I'll put a picture of it in the Patreon, but it's a really neat picture of Jace. Maybe a little sad on the beach. It kind of sounds weird, but it's a striking. It's uh, Ixalan's binding, right? Yeah, sure. I guess. Is that what it is? I don't know. Anyway, I'll put a picture of it up on the Patreon. I'm going to be. I don't know. I think that someone who does 
commentary would know the pictures of the cards, but yes, I believe no, no, no. It, it's a unique playmat. It, it's I actually that... a photograph of the beach in Nice, but Jace is like bummed out and on it. Oh, okay. Yeah. My um, yeah. It's a, <laughs> it's a striking image. Anyway, and I'll be giving that away. The one I'm giving away today, though. Let me grab it. This is the one. Um, is it a this, cat? These are all the crack pack cards, and I ended up throwing in a ton of uh, random. Uh, unstable stuff, uh, a bunch of tokens and some of the rares that I got, stuff like that. Uh, and then also this has the Fuente Consagrada. Remember that one, Luis? Yes, that's the Hallowed Fountain. Yeah, the Hallowed Fountain's in here. There's a Carney T, a Rampaging Ferocidon. Anyway, a whole pile of cards that I'm going to be giving away. And you get those in a limited resources deck box with a package of limited resources sleeves and a sticker as well. This one is going out to Carl Helprin from Minneapolis. Thank you so much, Carl. I appreciate your support on the Patreon for all that time. Carl's actually been supporting us for quite a while, and it certainly means a lot to us. So I'll be sending that out to you um, probably right after the holiday is over, um, just because it's going to be a pretty big mess down at the post office. But uh, we're going to do a, a quick crack a pack today that will start seeding that right back up again. And once it gets to enough stuff, I'll be giving that away. Like I said, a bunch of other cool stuff as well. All right, let's get the pe- Patreon question of the week, which I uh, somehow failed to uh, to grab. So I'm going to do it right now, Luis. This is this is going to be on the fly Patreon question See, of the week. I don't. I would have done it, but it. I don't have access to it. Well, maybe if you were a patron, you would. I'm not. It's I'm not paying not true, money to 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 get access to my own podcast feed. <laughs> Oh, you know what I forgot to do is to put up the new – I thought I actually put up the new one, but I didn't, and that's why I have this situation. Anyway, okay. Let's see here. Uh, seven territorial oh, – that's a lot of those. Um, <laughs> this is funny. I've got – this is uh, – uh, needs to be refreshed, obviously. Uh, let's see here. All right, here we go. Logan says, hey, guys, my local game store is hosting a backdraft for Halloween. (laughs) While I know it's not typical limited environment and maybe even uh, one of you all might not find it enjoyable. Do you have any advice on how to approach drafting the worst possible deck and then trying to create a deck out of the bad cards someone else has drafted? So backdraft, if you've never done it, uh, which is what, of course, Logan's asking about, is uh, a draft where you sit down and you draft a deck but the deal is, is that you end up giving the deck to somebody else at the table and you get somebody else's deck randomly well, you, as well. You switch with your opponent. Yeah, the person who you're going to play, right? Yeah. So it – and the point, of course, then being, well, you're going to try to screw them over as hard as you can. You're going to try to give them the worst pile of cards possible. And it really – I actually love backdraft for starters. This is a John well, Lauk special. You, you, are, you are really good at backdraft. In fact, you don't really have to change your strategy very <laughs> Come much on, at all. man. It's like low-hanging fruit, right? <laughs> and uh, I, I do love backdraft. And I got to tell you. You can actually learn from it. it. It makes you think about magic and drafting in a way different way than you might just think of like, oh, I'll just draft a bad deck. I've done that a bunch of times, right? No, it's actually way different than that. Um, you have to go kind of deep on it. One of the big strategies that you can do is try to make it so that the person who builds a deck simply cannot resolve their spells. So you draft all the colors and as many in, you know, double mana spell. Uh, dem- double mana symbol cards as possible. Uh, you don't take any colorless cards, God forbid, because then they'd be able to actually cast something. And you just try to hand them a pile and say, here, you figure out the mana for this. Of course, you're going to try to cross-section that with the weakest selection of cards as well and see if they if they can come up with something. And, you know, another thing that I've seen people do, and I think this is a funny strategy, is just to try to draft like the one drops, you know, the, the, the basically the lowest impact card so that even if they do get to play out their hand, it does so little that they, that they can't, you know, win against something yeah, even reasonable. You also really want to prioritize cards that can't end the game. So yes. as many spells and pump, like pump spells and card draw and all that like nonsense stuff that we tell you not to play too much of, you want to end up with your opponent having five creatures in their deck so that it's going to be very difficult for them to <laughs> yeah, actually and, win and any And it's games. all auras and pump spells and stuff, yeah. So anyway, that's what I would do. But also, I don't know. I mean, I would have to do this a lot more to have like a really great feel for it. and Or I'd just have to ask John because John was a master. He, he loved a backdraft and uh, he got pretty good at it too. Or pretty bad as it were. All right, let's do a crack a pack. Luis, I got a pack from uh, Ryan Steelman. 
think that's what that says. Um, unstable. And I figured, you know what? When are we really going to undo? When are we really going to crack an unstable pack other than right now? And uh, I'm not doing another Ixalan pack. So let's just get this thing open. And this way, I we get a sweet basic land. Draft. You were? Mm hmm. Ooh. I had three red triggers, a one drop, one one that assembles a contraption. And that card is real good. Oh, yeah. That one's really nice. What was your best uh, contraption? Uh, I had the ocular implants that lets you tap a creature to draw a card. Oh, that's nice. And it becomes an artifact or whatever. Yeah, it was really, really yeah. good. And then I had yeah. a couple of contraptions that made creatures. So Did you have the one that makes the 2-2 two -two mm -hmm. rogue? The 2-2 two -two yeah. menace rogue. The that's the, rogue I had dispensary. that one too. Yeah, I had that one too. And I think that was the best one that I had, at least for me. But Okay, well, let's get into this. We're not going to take too much time with the unstable crack a pack because it's more just for fun and to get some cards going for the next thing. But... We're going to do it anyway. Uh, this one's called Hoisted Hireling. Two and a black for a 2-1. It has flying as long as, as it's being held above the battlefield. I thought that one was kind of funny. <laughs> it's really funny. And it's actually decent. I wouldn't yeah, and you can just pick it up, right? Like yeah. all right. It's actually uh, better than flying because you can make it gain or lose flying without using the stack. Exactly. Uh, common Iguana. This is one of those. I don't know. What do what they call The host system? augment creatures. This is a 1 yeah. red for a 1-3. And then when it enters the battlefield, you get to draw a card and discard a card. Close. Or discard a card, then draw a card. Right? Exactly. Seems pretty, yeah, bad. Um, pretty bad. This is called Capital Offense with no capital letters. Uh, also spelled, anyway. Two black, black, instant. Target creature gets minus X, minus X until end of turn, where X is the number of times a capital letter appeared in its rules text. Funny. I found this to be fairly unconditional removal, so I think you're, you're fine taking this card. Okay. Uh, Joyride Rigor. This is three and a green for a 3-3 three, three that uh, lets you assemble a contraption when it enters the battlefield. Uh, I like Capital Fence a little bit more, but Joyride Rigor is good. Uh, this card's called Success. It's called it's a white instant, and the creature gets plus two, plus two until a turn. If it's a host or has augment, it gains lifelink. Whatever. I'm not even... Yeah, I like this weird. one. I played a bunch of these. I played like two of these, I think, in my deck. Crafty Octopus. Yes, this is... The two and a blue one three uh, mm -hmm. host creature that when it enters the battlefield assembles a contraption. Right. This this was kind of my like you had the one drop red creature you talked I had about. Two, this this is one, one too. Also. Yeah. yeah. Oh wow. So it, you kind of did it. Yeah. This card's very good because not only is a three mana one three that assembles a contraption good enough, you can augment and just start doing it over and over again if you have the right cards. Well, I don't understand this. One. It's it's called Novelemental. This is the, just a welcome turn. It's one of the yeah. for a two one flying can only block flyers. Yeah, I don't really get What's it. What's the joke here? There's four different versions, and they tell a story in their flavor text. Oh, I see. But I didn't whatever. Get that. I was just at Crafty Octopus. Um, despondent Killbot, two mana, two one. Basically, if you don't have the rare uh, Mary O Kill, then <laughs> you 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 don't want the Killbots. So okay, I'm not going to take a Killbot. Uh, what about Garbage Elemental, four and a red, three one, when it enters the battlefield. You assemble a contraption, and it also has Undying. By the way, this is an uncommon. This version is pretty good. There's four different versions of this card also. And they just oh, there are? <laughs> they just have all random keywords. Man, I, I, like love, I really like it that you did the set review for this because yeah. you just know all these cards. I can't yeah, remember. Yeah, somehow. Uh, yes, Garbage Elemental is good. This one, this one seems like a good version. Uh, this is an Augment card called Ninja. This is uh, the... It's like... I don't remember the exact stats on it. It's, it's the plus card. one, plus oh. This this is the the one you can augment as an instant, right? Is that it? And when it hits them, uh, it does something. You can activate. Yes, yes, that's right. And then yeah, whenever it hits them, it hits a player. Yeah. Yeah, I like the garbage elemental more. Okay, yeah, I'll ditch that one. This one's called Socketed Sprocketeer. It's red for a one one. It tap to uninstall all results from Socketed Sprocketeer, then roll it's a six blue side. For a one -one. Blue for what did I say? Red. Oh my god! I don't want to read the rest of this. Basically, it lets this you. This is way too complicated. It lets you store does. a die roll on it, and then you can, and it just is sitting there, and then you can use that instead of any other die roll. Okay. Or you Why can just say that. Or you can remove a six from it to draw a card. I, I would, at this point, still take garbage elemental. All right. Um, our rare is Hangman. Yay! This one's cool. It lets you play Hangman. It's black for a yeah, one one. A, look at the background. They they've guessed an A, but there should be two A's in Hangman. Oh no, you're totally right. Isn't that just embarrassing? It just says H A space G. The, the, oh the, no, the, this the, this this is a, an atrocity. It's a travesty to flavor. So I'm taking garbage elemental out of uh, protest in uh, because it's the best card. That's great. All right, so we've got. Do all packs have two contraptions? Ooh, we got a mythic one. Ooh, what is it? I'm not going to read that one. I'm going to read the other one first. 
the not mythic one is called treadmill. Whenever you crank it, target creature gets plus two or plus one, plus two, gains vigilance and becomes an artifact. Blah blah blah. Mm-hmm. BB gun. This is cool. It's like a dolphin with a revolver shooting bees. It's whenever you crank BB gun until end of turn, target creature gains two. This creature fights another target creature. Oh my god. <laughs> That is pretty right. good. Would you like that better than uh, what was yeah, it? Yeah, I think that I think that this contraption is very good, especially if you can combine it with some decently sized creatures. All right, and now the really important part: what do we get for basic land? Ooh, the best one, island. Of course. Oh, and we got a good token too. We got the elemental, the one that goes oh, with from Voice of Resurgence. Yeah, sweet people. Oh, are we be happy it. when you send them this pack. I will. All right. So there's our cracker pack. What do we end up taking? The BB gun? Yeah, I think the BB gun. I would definitely take the BB gun. I had to play against the BB gun, and it was not fun. We got complete. I got smoked by that. <clears throat> I mean, I won the match, obviously, but okay. Let's get into it. So our topic this week is going to be team events. We have received a not insignificant number of requests for this topic, uh, one that we have covered at some point on the show before, but figured it was worth a refresh because of what's going to happen next year. Next year is the 25th anniversary for Magic, and uh, part of that celebration is there's going to be a Pro Tour that has teams on it. And around that, they've ramped up the number of GPs, that have teams, uh, team GPs. They've introduced this new team trios constructed format that we touched on earlier, but there's of course still team sealed for limited. And they're even, they're even doing some team PTQs. Um, apparently at the GP that I mentioned earlier at GP Santa Clara on day two, if you want a PTQ, well, you're going to have to bring the team with you for that as well. So there's more team things going on in the, in the, in the next few months than there has been before. And we know that a lot of you are going to try to assemble some type of squad and head out and try to, to, to win yourself some prizes or get on the pro tour or do whatever it is that your goals are. So we figured, sure, let's get into it. We've got another week before we do the uh, sunset show for, for Ixalan. And, uh, we're going to talk teams here. So let's start from the top here, Luis, what's step number one when it comes to, uh, competing in a team event? Yeah, you got to find a team. It, yeah. it is a team yep. event. You need to find two other Magic players. And this is why team events are so good. And this is why, you know, well, this is one of the reasons why uh, a lot of people love them. Some people love them because <clears throat> if you have a good win percentage, that is heightened in a team event. <laughs> but honestly, Some reason, people love that. Yes, Louise. <laughs> the, the, the reason that uh, teams are so fun is because you you get to select a team. And that that is just really awesome because... If you're winning, you're winning with your friends, so you all get to like high five each other and be like, "Yeah, we're crushing." I mean, you 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 know, you everyone has been to a tournament where they're doing well, but their friend went 03, and their friend is like, "Yeah, I know I'm supposed to be happy for you, but I'm feeling a little bummed out." And you can't like celebrate too much, right? Sometimes, mm-hmm. yeah. But in a team event, like your two friends are also there with you, so celebrate away. Even better, when you lose, you've got two losers with you. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> you're, you're not sitting on the sidelines watching your friends crush it. They're right in the same boat as you, and you you all get to, to hang out and commiserate and talk you, about how, how unlucky you are. You can all are. go to the sorrow dinner together. Exactly. So I think the most important thing when you're talking about a teammate is just make sure that you have similar goals as your teammates. Some people want to practice a ton, and their goal is to crush the tournament. Perfectly valid. Some people want to hang out and play the Day of Magic with their friend and see how things fall. And maybe they'll do one or two drafts or seals beforehand, but they're not really looking to to go too deep. Or, or mm-hmm. it's a constructed tournament. They're like, oh, whatever modern deck I can borrow will be fine. Mm-hmm. You don't want these people on the same team because that's just going to lead to feel bads. You're going to lead to someone saying, oh, we're not practicing enough. We should be doing this. We should be doing that. And the other person saying, like, oh, you're taking this too seriously. You know, calm down. So – I think it's important to find people who kind of want the same things out of the tournament and find people who you like spending time with, friends, people who you will be happy to lose with, people you won't get mad at if they screw up. Like, look, your teammates are going to make mistakes. You're going to make mistakes. Getting mad at them is not a good or productive way to run the tournament or your friendship. So yeah, really important to try to do that. And, you know, if sometimes you end up with a, a team of people you don't really know too well, this happens. Well, so it's a chance to make new friends, and I think you 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 can take advantage of that because it's a very good bonding experience. Yeah, you know, I have a little story for this. Uh, you know, Woody, 
my buddy who, you know, if you, if you watch the vlogs, you'll know what he also streamed with him. And he wanted to play, you know, he lives not that far from Santa Clara now. And, uh, he was having a hard time finding a legacy player for this tournament. Cause not that many ple- people play legacy anymore and getting a team together proved kind of difficult for him. And he kind of reached out actually through my coworker, Mark, and found two teammates and, you know, one's from Europe and one's from here. And, and, you know, he doesn't even hardly know them, but, you know, they all are like-minded. Like you said, they all, you know, want to, want to try hard and, and see if they can win the tournament. And I just think it's great, right? I mean, he, you know, Woody could, could make some friends there or find some testing partners or some people to bounce ideas off, uh, you know, send a Facebook message. Hey, what do you think of this list? Or would you change the sideboard? Just those little, little connections and, and friendships that you form. Um, if you're, if you're open, you know, to being on a team, maybe, you know, if you have a hard time finding one locally, or if there's not that many players around or whatever. And that actually leads to our next point, which is for team constructed, if they're going to be run like this, which looks like is the new standard Mm -hmm. standard, uh, (laughs) try to find people who specialize in each format if you can, because a team of three people who play a ton of standard is just not as good as a team of a person who plays standard, a person who plays modern and a person who plays legacy. Even if maybe that second team has people who are on the balance, not quite as good as the first team. So it is good to try to find a team where you, the third is not like, oh, do I have to play modern? Like that, yeah, I mean, everybody should, yeah, have a slot that they're pretty yeah, happy so, with, right? So you, yeah. you want to find find a team where the people enjoy their constructed format and, you know, are competent in it. Though it's good that if everyone knows something about all of them so you can be useful to your teammates as well. Uh, this is a big one, the next, next one. Your record is your team record. Every time someone says, what's your record? And you say, I'm 5-0, but my team is 3-2. I feel like that your teammates should get to dock you. I don't know. You have to pay for dinner or something like that or buy a drink because I like this. That, that is just not how you approach team teams at all. Like, look, we all know what our record is right at the end of the day mm-hmm. because we, we played our matches. It, it, it can be funny to be like, I'm 2-3, but my team is 5-0. I have great teammates. That That part's good. You're allowed don't, to do the opposite. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> don't Don't be the guy who's like – I'm 4-0, but we're 2-2 because it's like, no, you're 2-2. Stop complaining. Uh, a funny note, Jacob Wilson has a record, which I don't think will be beaten. He went 1-15 and and won a Team Grand Prix. <laughs> Unfortunately, that, that, one was, that, that one was me. Really? I'm the only person he beat oh, in no! the entire tournament. <laughs> he saved it all up for you. Yep. And uh, they actually Sorry. beat us in the finals of that Grand Prix. <laughs> God, that's insane. So, yeah, that is just... That is tough to do. Um, but but I totally agree. Look, I think the way to approach it is to own your decisions before, right? Like, no, going into the tournament, hey, this is my squad, right? And I'm going to go down with the ship if it goes down, or I'm going to, you know, hoist up that trophy if we make it that far. But you make that decision before you walk in the building. That way you're not doing the finger pointy thing. You're not doing the thing where... You know, I, I won this or, you know, maybe you look over and your teammate makes a mistake. That's going to happen. Like, of course, we'll talk about it, but you're allowed to help, you know, each other out. But, you know, it is still going to happen that you go, oh, did you just tap that mana? Oh, no. Like that, you know, now you're not going to be able to cast this in case opponent top decks blank. You know, you own it, right? You say, well, this is my teammate and, you know, they're, they're, they're either got me this far or, or you know, I'm going to lose because of it. But it's on you as much as it is on them. And, and I think it's just a much healthier and it's also just a much more practical way to approach it. Because, look, if you were so great, you might have been able to find two pros to play with. You know, if, if it's also, you know, partly a cultivation of where you're at, who you who you can play with as well. So keep keep that in mind before you go in. So one of the big reasons that you want good team synergy is that communication within your team and how you work together in deck building for limited Grand Prix, in deck selection for constructed and in communication during the matches, that is where, where team the team part of it really comes into play. Like... To use an example of a team uh, that has been very, very successful, David Williams, Matt Sperling, and Paul Rietzel. They won uh, team, the team, the Return to Ravnica team uh, Grand Prix in San Jose. They mm-hmm. lost in the finals of the next uh, team, uh, team tournament in San Jose. And overall, they, you know, that team just crushes it. I think that they have many times beaten teams that have three more accomplished players. Paul Rietzel's in the Hall of Fame, so you know he, he's he's very near the top. And Matt, but Matt Sperling and Dave Williams, despite being very very good players, like they don't have the resume of like Yuya Watanabe or you know sure. Owen Turtenwald or whoever. 
But I've seen them over and over again defeat teams which are on paper better. And the reason is their team has one of the best team synergies I've ever seen because they all know each other so well and know each other's play styles and know how to communicate that they don't give up ground on communicating in a way that the other team can understand. They know how to Mm -hmm. build their sealed decks and divide the cards well. They know what kind of advice to give, when to give it, when not to give it. And, you know, that that's the sort of thing you only get after, first of all, teaming multiple times. Second of all, having a lot of time with your teammates because no teams are going to communicate the same way. And you need to find out what's the most effective for your team. To use an example of myself, when I'm on a team with Ben S, which I have been a number of times, Ben tunnel visions on his match. He he's yeah. not gonna he's not gonna look at your match and he's not really gonna ask for help. He just wants to play his match. And like if you ask him, hey, should I keep this or hey, what do you think about this? He'll sometimes answer you and sometimes he'll be like, I don't really know the context. You figure it out, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and likewise, he's not often gonna ask for help on his match, and that's fine. That is how Ben plays that, and that's how I know to interact with Ben. On the other hand, I always sit in the middle when I'm on teams. That's never not happened because I'm always paying attention to all three matches. Yeah, because you have the ability to do that. Yes, and so I'm not going to ask for help a ton either, but I will observe the other matches and know what's going on in them, whereas I know I can't expect that from Ben, and that's just how we are. So we need to figure out a communication style that takes that into account. So you need to have at least even some practice seals, ideally for stakes. Like, it's all well and good to do practice seals with your teammates and then play something. What you need to do is the day before the Grand Prix or the day before whatever team tournament, if you can play like a trial, you know, a side event, that's really valuable because you've you've done like practice seals against your friend Adam, right? Oh, yeah. Tons of them. In fact, I did one today. Exactly. They feel very different than when you're at a, just at a bounty event at, at a, like a, a Grand Prix, right? Much different, yes. Right. Presumably to you that they, those shouldn't be different. You don't, you, the stakes you're playing for don't really affect you, you're, you right? Yeah. You're, you're not really playing for much in either way. You sit down at a tournament where a judge posts pairings and you have a result slip and you're playing an opponent you don't know. It is a completely different world and you need that environment to really see how your team is going to function in like, you know, the, the, when the bright lights are on you. Yeah. The, the bare minimum, and, and you see this, by the way, a lot from the pro community, is to go seek out another team that you know is good and play against them. Because even if it isn't quite that exact thing that you describe where like you're in a strict tournament setting, you're playing against a team that's probably better than the average team that you're going to play against at the tournament. And pros know like th- there's an ego thing or whatever. Like they're not going to just mess around and let the other team win. They want the bragging rights. They want to walk out of there. And I've seen this countless times in the day or the night or even the day of they'll seek out another team. And I've been there and watched it and they'll battle and it's for and, real. You know, And I've heard rumors that there are ways to make it so that you actually are playing for stakes of some kind. <laughs> I haven't, I haven't been able to corroborate. You know, we're myself. allowed to talk about whatever we want on <laughs> the podcast. Yes. You, if you wanted, you could put money up on it as well. <laughs> whoa, 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 I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> or as they call them on, Honor points or whatever it is, but yes. So figuring out your team's communication style, what works and what doesn't work. Like I have seen teams implode. You, I mean, you've, you've covered team Grand Prix. You've played in them. You've, you've yes. been around these. You've seen teams where teammates start yelling at each other. Oh you've my seen, God. I actually have the worst story of all time about this. Mm-hmm. It wasn't during a Grand Prix. It was during Worlds. This is the first Worlds I ever played at, Worlds 2006. And... The team portion of that was a Roch- team Rochester draft. All the cards are face up. Oh, God. And all six players that are taking cards. And j- usually the team captain or the most experienced drafter, if that wasn't the team captain, runs the whole draft because they see everything and they just tell everyone what to pick. The Australian team that year had a very good team captain, uh, a guy named Tim He, who sadly doesn't play anymore. I thought he was awesome. Mm-hmm. His third person on his team wasn't very experienced and was getting frustrated because Tim was just not, was just telling him what to do. He hate drafted from his own team because he got mad. <gasps> oh my God. Are you serious? <laughs> it's like, I'm tired of you telling me what to do. I'm taking a card that I'm not going to play that you are going to play. Like it was insane. So. That's, that's incredible. <laughs> oh my God. I, so I saw a few things. Like I saw somebody call their teammate, their teammate an idiot and to the point that his face started turning. He was in. The, he was the only one playing still, and the guy made a mistake, and it was a mistake. And he's like, "You're an idiot." 
And the guy's like, dude, back off. I'm trying to play. And he's like, why are you such an idiot? And I'm like, dude, that guy's on your team. And his face if was said, like, if he was said that super the opponent, flustered. The judges would be on your case. <laughs> yes. So, so yes. <laughs> he didn't you, draft for him. Don't, don't be this team. Be a team that can work together. And so that, that's really important. And it sounds like we're spending a lot of time here. And that's because this, this more than the cards you get and the plays you make is going to be the difference between winning and losing. Because look, when you open 12 packs, like there's a range, sure, but th- it's a lot flatter, right? Like rolling a hundred dice has less variance than rolling one. Mm-hmm. So you, you can end up uh, with a pretty solid deck almost every time, but how well you work together as a team is where you're going to gain and lose a lot of this team percentage. Right. So I think when you're the, the only seat that matters is the middle because the two edge seats are exactly the same. So the really, the, there's only one decision, right? Who sits in the middle? And there's no gaming that, right? I hear I hear teams talk about this every time because they'll start God, no. to see a pattern where it's like, oh, the A player was aggressive for our first three matches, but th- that's just random. Like you can't it's completely figure random. That out. Even like maybe the middle has a slight bias towards control, but even then, I would not I would not worry about gaming. You certainly think, wouldn't adjust your seating no. based on that, would you? What you want to put in the middle is not necessarily the best player, though that's where most people default to. That's why I've been in the middle every time. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> Just slip that in there. <laughs> well, actually what you do, and, and I, I've been on teams where I've been, I think, the weakest player, by the way, but I still sat in the middle. And the reason is you want to put your fastest slash most helpful player in the middle, put the person with the most bandwidth to pay attention because they're the person who can see the other two matches. The two people on the ends basically aren't in the same universe, right? It's really hard to look over two 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 matches and try to figure out what's going on. Yeah, you basically have to be finished with your match to go to the other person. Yes. So you want to put your the person who's gonna be the most helpful. Also, like for let's say team constructed, because you know the decks in advance, you might end up in a situation where one of your players is just playing a deck they're just not that familiar with. You need to sit sit, sit them next to next to someone who knows that deck. And yeah, uh, I've seen this definitely. happen before, you know, at, at a worlds in like 2010 where it was legacy standard modern and their standard player was just not super experienced so they made sure to sit him next to someone who could who could you know be yeah. be a resource um the other thing is don't talk too much honestly the teams that talk a ton are the teams that i feel tend to do worse on average because Definitely. first of all you want people who can just play on their own merits second of all when you talk you're giving the opponents information they're not – look, don't treat them like NPCs. They're not just sitting there you know, with their hands in their ears going la di da di da like I wonder what's for dinner. Right. They're, they're listening to you say like, oh, they have a decision on turn four. Oh, my spell is on the stack and they're deciding whether I should play something. Right. Oh, they're deciding whether to block my 4-4 with their 3-3. In all these cases, they're like, look, they have two 4 drops. Look, they have a counter spell. Look, they have a pump spell. Exactly. So, so don't, don't give away free information and don't get draws. If you talk too much, if it becomes a 3v3 with only one match left, <laughs> that, the, the, it slows to a crawl and that's how you get draws. Team events get draws very easily. Yeah. I think that the, the, the they're a little too lenient on how much time you get for that, but you oh, yeah. should certainly be aware of it because draws are terrible. So, so that covers the non-cards part of it, or at least the start of that. And uh, we're going to move into seal strategy because... This isn't a podcast about constructed, so you know the, you can and and for that tournament, it's honestly not that different. Just pick the three best constructed decks that you can come up with. Like, there's yeah, no, there's, there's no and, weird, there's no there's, weird meta game going. No, there. there's nothing weird with that. I mean, sometimes the unified ones introduce a, an interesting twist, but you know, especially for the team trios constructed that we have now, uh, <laughs> it's pretty straightforward, right? You're not meta gaming it too much, and plus. Nope. For especially for modern and legacy, a lot of time you're not going to have a choice anyway because people right, don't you have a, five, you know, modern or legacy decks just sitting around. Yeah, when, when you find a legacy player, just go with whatever they've got. Yes. <laughs> what deck are you playing? The one I have. Okay, you're on the team. And free tip: play Team Rune Standard. <laughs> <laughs> so for sealed strategy, uh, this is going to bounce between Ixalan and not Ixalan, but Ixalan and Rivals, you know, is going to come out. Have have these themes that are relevant to the format now, so we're going to talk about those. Yeah. So you're splitting up twelve packs uh, in between, and you're making three decks. And there are five colors of magic. Three decks, five colors. What does that mean? It means that you're going to split one of the colors, or someone's going to play mono color, and most likely it's going to be that you're splitting a color. Yeah, that that ha- that is easily the most likely scenario. So in Excel, that's actually easier because. Green Merfolk cards and green dinosaur cards don't even necessarily want to be in the same place. So yeah. when you split a color, you're not even you're barely splitting a color because yeah. Excellent isn't really divided that way anyway. 
But just know from the start that you're going to have to do something along those lines. The, the, the first place to start, it's like in a normal sealed, but even more important, which is looking at the signpost. These are your, you know, your gold cards, your bomb rares, your bomb uncommons. And if you open, you know, hostage taker, dead eye plunderers, two sky terrors and a Hotly, the first thing I'm doing is building blue, black, building red, white, and building some kind of green deck. Yeah, absolutely. And it doesn't mean you're going to play this deck. It doesn't mean like, oh, I opened two Sky Terrors. We have to have Red White. But, you know, I would be willing to bet every pool that has two Sky Terrors in it is like 80% to have a straight Red White deck. Exactly. Like there have to be a complete disaster or something really weird to pull you away from that. Yeah, because the gold cards are just a bonus. If you make like if you make any deck but Red White, you're not going to be able to play these two very good cards. Sky Terrors is a great card if you can cast it on turn two. Mm-hmm. <laughs> It's also a great card if you cast it on turn four. Mm-hmm. So th- these are the places to start. And then you can you know play around from there. Uh, you also want to sort cards by color. And I like to kind of aggressively call the unplayable cards. I do too. Because it just takes less time to look through smaller stacks. And what you're trying to figure out isn't whether red is playable. All the colors are going to be playable on almost every deck except for some very weird cases. What you want to figure out is why you want to play each color and which colors are support and which colors are uh, the base colors. Because what you'll do a lot of the times is let's say you have 15 good red aggro cards. You'll lay out those, right, curved and all. Like I like laying out creatures on a curve and then spells on a curve below that. And then you'll put in like, okay, what does this look like compared with the white cards? What does this look like? Or combined with white cards or combined with blue cards to try to figure out like, what the aggro deck's supposed to look like. But you know this base of red cards isn't really going anywhere or being split up because it's these like aggressive red cards that all play well together. And you're just looking for seven other cards or eight other cards to to pair with them. You're not you don't have to rebuild the deck from scratch. You just slot in until you find out what the best support is for that. Similarly if you had like 14 good black control cards, then that's what you would do. And in Ixalan it's even easier because you have tribal cards your anointed deacon yeah. is going to go, you know, w- with your, you know, queen's commission. That's just not going to get split up very often. And even more starkly, they're going to go within the cards of that color. Your sky march blood letter, you know, is not is not straying far from your anointed deacon. So you you can kind of swap around like that and try to figure out which are the colors that can support two people or two tribes and get to a point where you have three decks that look cohesive. I tend to want players to build a deck they're the most comfortable with. And what that leads to is players tend to play the deck that they built. But I think that's okay. It's not, it's not, you're not just tricking yourself. Though people have an attachment to decks they built themselves, which isn't something you should factor in. What you should do is have the person who likes playing white aggro, the person who's drafted Merfolk 15 times, build the white aggro deck or build the Merfolk deck. Sure. They just, they're just better at it. Keep it simple, right? And, how do you, you split up the like really – there's usually one great deck. Yeah. So we'll, we'll get to that in a second. But okay. it is – there is something to to think about there. Um, I also like switching the decks at some point in the build process just to have new eyes on it. Like, yeah. You know, you, you've been sitting there looking at Merfolk for 15 minutes. At some point, be like, here, Marshall, just hand me all the Merfolk cards. I'll build a Merfolk deck. Yeah. I, and, I like that. I like doing that a lot. That That's something that comes up in team drafting where you'll often sit down, lay out the deck that you had the idea of, plus or minus a couple of cards, you know, your last few cuts. And then you'll say, hey, sit in my seat, go over everything, and tell me if you'd change anything. This is a similar process to that. And and you have an hour. So you actually have a pretty good amount of time for all this. Yeah, as long as you're good with the mechanics of opening up the cards, getting them sorted, doing that call. You you kind of brushed over it, Luis, but I think that's really important is to get the stuff out that's – either very bad or even marginal, you can always go back and look if you, you know, think that your headwater sentries might actually make the cut. But in the meantime, yeah, get it out of the way. There's some Merfolk decks with three Vine Shaper Mystics that, yeah, maybe it gets in there. Yeah, but but, but in the meantime, you don't need to be staring at it. And, and what you find is, and we've mentioned this before and we should have at the top of this, is that sealed – uh, team seal decks are very, very strong, right? Like your expectation yes. for how good the deck should be should be very high relative to individual sealed for sure. And yes, even relative to draft decks, they're yes, the, often these are, better. The, these are better than draft decks because you're yeah. you're, t- you're not twice as good as a six pack deck. You're more than that because you get to separate all the cards into the piles that want them, and then you have twelve packs to build from. Exactly. So, 
So, so I'm pretty aggro about that. I'll get all yeah. that stuff because what ends up happening is you think, oh, I'll just keep the headwater sentries in case maybe, and then I'll keep this other one and you lay it out and you have 39 playables and you're like, yes. oh wow, no, I'm getting rid of all this, you know, mediocre stuff right away. Yeah. Headwater sentries is not a card I would expect to ever play in an excellent team sealed. If, exactly. If, if that happens, you're probably in trouble or you have something really weird going on. Right. Even though you might think to yourself, well, you know, I did play it in a, in a Merfolk draft deck a couple of times because I needed just a four drop or another Merfolk or it was a little bit defensive. I might just, uh, any of those questionable, get them out because I can guarantee you, you're not going to want them. And then, uh, you know, to fast forward just a little bit, I always go back and look at that pile to make sure that there was not something that, that actually yeah, look, would fit, you know. You're all going to look through the, the unplayables pile 17 times. Yeah, that, that's exactly. <laughs> but I think people when, think that when you cull it, it's just like you're ripping it up and you're never no, going to look no, at it again. Right? Well, you look through it a bunch of times because what will happen is you'll be like, wow, this ed deck ended up like being really improvised themed. Do we have any crappy, you know, inventor's goggles hiding out mm-hmm. over there? Yeah, that sort of thing. Yep. Though, <laughs> Owen said he hid all the inventor's goggles during uh, Team he USA did. deck building. He did. He actually <laughs> took them out of the deck. Anyway, yeah, that was pretty um, So a common fallacy is that people will be like, this pool's bad. First of all, they tend to over overestimate when a pool is bad. <laughs> and, and they say, like, yes. let's just make two really good decks and one crappy deck. Mm-hmm. Doesn't really work that way in general. It certainly doesn't work that way in Ixalan doesn't help to have your pirate deck have 30 cards <laughs> you know it doesn't help if your if your dinosaur deck takes all the, the the good merfolk cards right so basically you still want to make three decks you still want to you can you you'll have a sense of the power level sometimes you will end up with decks that are better than others obviously but the the the, the plan of trying to like make one deck worse to make the other decks better it doesn't usually work out that way and because it's still limited it's not like your good decks are going to win tons more no. And it's not like your bad deck's going to lose tons more either. It's just you, what you want to do is, especially in such a heavily tribal theme format, you know, find the tribal themes that make the most sense. That's it's really not that much more complicated than that for Ixalan. Though uh, Team Sealed in general is very hard to build. Uh, it's, it can be very overwhelming for sure, which again oh, is another sure. reason why I like simplifying it as much as possible yeah. at the front. Yeah. So once you have what you think the decks are, do a sanity check. Are you playing all your bombs? The answer is not always going to be yes. Sometimes you just end Should up with be a, darn close though. Yeah, but sometimes you end up with like you have enough gold cards and colors that overlap that you just can't make a red black deck because you already have a red blue and a blue black deck. Yeah, that and happens. So, sometimes you'll leave some out, but like you said, it should be pretty close. You have to have a good reason. There's no well, clearly there's no reason to ever have a hostage taker in your sideboard. But I I can imagine scenarios where you have some other good you know multicolored card like a marauding looter in a sideboard even though that mm-hmm. card i expect to get played in like 85 percent of all seals yep uh do all the decks have removal well hopefully the answer is yes because you're playing against good decks and you're going to be playing against a lot more you know hostage taker type cards than you would in a normal sealed so make sure that the decks have something and sometimes that means you know taking a card out of a, a deck where you normally think it should belong in a, a one specific deck just because the other deck's like look this deck just really needs a removal spell. And this, by the way, comes up a lot, right? Because a, a lot of times you'll see the patterns play out that way where there's one deck that is playing two colors and that's the only uh, of your team, that that's the only time when those colors are seen play at all. And then the other two decks share a color. And, yeah. you know, that kind of has to happen. And that's where a lot of those tough decisions come in. Or, well, well, I've got five pieces is, of removal. Who needs what? Is you might see a Savage Stomp in the mm-hmm. Merfolk deck, even though it's better in the Dinosaur deck, because the Dinosaur deck's playing red and has unfriendly fire and two fire cannon blasts. Yeah. Also, and a good one to to flip that is Pounce. You might see that yeah. in the Dinosaur deck, even though uh, – because it, it, it's good in there where the Merfolk deck doesn't really want it that much. Yeah. So you so don't be afraid to move things out even outside yeah. of the place they, quote, should be. Yeah. Um, make sure all the decks have a cohesive game plan. What you don't want to do is build a control deck then realize, oh, I don't have a good late game win condition or I don't have no. a good removal spell. I think this is probably the most, the most like it's the broadest point here, but it's also the most important in that I never, and again, this goes against that, that fallacy that you said about the let's just build two great decks and a crappy one and hope to just scrap out some wins with a crappy one. I want every deck to checkbox all the things that Luis has just said here. And that game plan ends up being the most important one because sometimes... Look, I, ideally, I'd like all my decks to have a reasonable curve, good power level, hopefully great, but at least good, 
and some and enough removal so that I don't feel like the, if my opponent resolves just a threat, I can't beat it. Whether it's a big one or a small one or a utility creature or whatever, I just want to have all my bases checked where I say, I have the tools I need to win games. And you do and you do as well. The the time when you say, well, this deck just doesn't get those tools is when I think you've kind of just given up. You really should try to spread it out so that each person has a chance to play creatures, play removal, have some power at the top or middle, you know, wherever they get it and, and, and try to win games, uh, you know, straight up doing it that way. Yeah. And what, basically you don't want to be a worse version of your opponent's deck and you don't want to build a blue black control deck that can't beat any realistic control deck. Cause you're going to face yeah. a lot of good focus decks in this. Uh, make sure your aggro deck has a curve. Don't be like, well, red, white aggro is a, is a deck. And then you yep. just end up, end up like, oh, we have three, two drops. Uh, you know, how did we end up here? Right. So it's a deal breaker. Th yeah. These are just, this is just a sanity check of like, did we get there? You know, are we making decisions that make sense? Um, like we mentioned, you do shuffle around removal a lot. You do even do stuff like splash removal. Like I've taken black removal spells out to splash in like the green blue deck before because you have a little bit of mana fixing and because you just need a way to, to kill something. Yeah. You know, one thing that I wanted to mention here, Luis, it pops up and you've touched on it a little bit, but I don't know. I, I don't know really how to approach this because I think most of our listeners will probably uh, understand this already, but I've seen it enough times at these tournaments that I think we should probably mention it, which is just that, you know, you are playing as a team and I've seen people start to get attached to a deck and then also start to try to like keep the good cards for themselves. Yes. Th no, this, this totally has. Isn't that weird? It's like, it's, it's a team. It's like, like you're still playing a team tournament. Like, right. Like look, one way some, to, to some, break this would be to say, what if you just switch decks, right? Like, would you still be arguing the same way? Yeah, like, and you know, if you want to sanitize yourself. Yes. Yeah. Hopefully it is, but. Uh, and, and you'll start to split up sideboard cards. And I, I, I enjoy mm -hmm. this part of it because, look, what most people do is they're like, oh, we're done deck building. Okay, you get all the blue cards. You get all the green cards. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, that, that is not the correct way to do it. So first of all, if you're the only blue player, you should get most of the blue cards. But sometimes it's worth giving, like, the red-white deck a couple counter spells because maybe they'll side in counter spells against a, you know, in a weird Super situation. deck or something, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you want to make sure that you split up the artifact removal and the enchant removal. You want to make sure that... If like the green white aggro deck might board into green white like big stuff, you have those that those options there even and give them the like good late game white creatures, even if there's another white deck at the table. So put a little thought into your sideboard, not a whole lot, just a little. Mm -hmm. Especially and again, this comes up with the two decks that share a color, right? Mm -hmm. Because it, you know maybe maybe you've got even two copies of the same type of sideboard card, right? You know, you have two crushing canopies. Well, you might want to split them. Or maybe one of the decks is blue-green and has a ton of flyers and doesn't really care about it anyway, so you give them both to the other one. You know, just think about those, each of those small decisions because they do add up. And you can't take them back once you submit. Yes, sideboards remain with the deck. Uh, mm -hmm. And here's where we get to your point earlier where you split up the decks. Yeah. I think that you should take into account, the first and foremost, people's play styles. I think that's the by far the biggest factor. If okay. you have, you know, when I teamed with uh, with Pat Cox, who if you if you don't know him, his his name on Twitter is Wildest Nakatl. Oh, yeah. He all he does is play like these like white aggressive decks, right? I mm -hmm. mean, he, he can play other things, but that is what he does. And when I teamed with him at GP Cleveland, he got the white aggressive deck every time, and he did quite Which well. Which is good for you and good for him. <laughs> yes, and. Uh, you know, I, I tend to play the like bad blue deck, the deck that has all the like leftovers and blue cards because that mm -hmm. fits what I like to do a lot of the time. Well, because you're the strongest player on the team and because you, you like to try to find wins from piles. <laughs> yes. I, I, <laughs> you you had a lot of years of practicing drafting bad decks and trying exactly. to Exactly. And it gives my teammates all these good cards so I can complain if they don't win. Yeah, of course. <laughs> but you got all your so bases the, the, the first thing is, yeah, look for people's play styles. Second is what you mentioned earlier is sometimes it is worth giving a, a good, especially a straightforward deck to your weakest player. Yeah. And when I say weakest player, by the way, if you can leave ego at the door for this, your team will be the better for it. Like, look, you all know who the worst player on your team is. And they know, you know, it might be you. <laughs> they definitely yeah. know. Yeah. And some, and there's no shame in that. And sometimes, uh, you know, it's by a big enough margin that, yeah, the worst player should get the red, white aggro deck with a really good curve. Cause that deck's much easier to pilot than the like three color dinosaur control deck that's trying to stack a bunch of weird tricks. <laughs> yeah. So do that. And then 
lastly is play the if you can if it if it breaks like this play the fastest deck in the middle because you want the middle player to be free the soonest yeah uh and and you know you mentioned you touched on this earlier but you should make sure that middle player is the one who's the most accessible it doesn't necessarily mean the best player on your team yeah. it often does it, it usually that is the case but it isn't always that because you, you need to really look at your teammates and ask them what what style do deck do you want to play you know going back to Luis just said but also do you want to be bothered yeah do you want or can you give help can you give no. help? Are you available during your match? Because there are some people who, if you ask them a question in the middle of their match, it is a complete derailment of their thought process and they are going to suffer a lot. Not only are they not going to give you good advice, they're going to then play their match worse. Exactly. And you need to know that. It's not, look, we're not all super people, right? So you need to be able to say, look, when I, I really don't like it when people give me advice. Like if you see me doing something horrendous, then please tell me just in case. But like for the most part, and by the way, you know, too many cooks in the kitchen is a very, very real thing. So moving on to gameplay. So this is in the match. Mm -hmm. there, there's some things you can do here. Uh, first of all, watch how you shuffle, especially in the middle, because when you side shuffle your deck or your opponent's deck, it's easy for your opponents to see what's oh, going right. on or your teammates potentially. First of all, you don't want your teammates seeing it. Second of all, don't try to look. Like I, I've had opponents specifically like try to look while I'm shuffling. Ugh. Really? It's just, it's just that's dirty. Yeah. So that's just, just, don't do that. That's not how you should win. No. Uh, and we just kind of cover this. Figure out what level of moment you can have in your teammates' matches. You know, if you can keep an eye, great. Don't be disruptive. Don't cost them win percentage. If you see something critical coming up, try to keep an eye on it. Try not to give it up, especially if it's something like tricky, like a combat trick or, you know, an interaction that you don't want the opponents to know about. But let's say your opponent has a... You know, they, they played a pact of negation, and if they don't pay five men on their upkeep, they lose the game. Mm -hmm. That's worth keeping an eye on in being – you got your hair trigger responses. If they go to touch their deck, be like, no, 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 pay for the pact. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So, you, you, you know, you want to be able to do that. If you see something really critical coming up, try to pay attention to that. One, one thing I've seen people do that I think is actually probably pretty smart is if you see something potentially bad going on for your teammate, instead say, hey, come here – I have I have a spot and like show them your hand or something like that and then they come over to you and you say hey remember they have settled the wreckage <laughs> you know or yeah. whatever it is and they're like oh right okay and then they go back just like you you don't want to make it this crazy spy game of deception or whatever but there is a big deal if you look over unprompted and you see a situation forming and you come scooting over there to tell your teammate something specific. The opponent is going to go, oh, hold on a sec. Like you said, there's not an NPC and, and they, you may remind them of something, uh, you know, whatever. So if you do want to throw like a little curveball at them just to make sure that they don't know even which match you're talking about, that's perfectly fine. Just, you know, don't overdo it. Yeah. And you really don't want to give up info. It's really easy to let your opponents know something is going on. You know, you've mm -hmm. got to trust your teammates when they have a counter spell in hand. Assume they know what they should be doing, and if they don't, they'll ask you. But whenever a spell goes in the stack, don't be like, "Hold on, hold on," because that's the easiest it's way such to, a to get there. Yeah, you can, you can bluff them with that too if you want to play around with things. But <laughs> uh, I think that uh, in general, people give up more info than they help their team when they when they chime in. Like on average, I think people probably hurt their team by by talking too much. I think so too, which is weird because it is a big part of the the yeah. team aspect. But I don't, you know. Do you, would you kind of, it's, it's kind of tough because I know that the people that you team with are, are your close friends and people that you've played with for, for a really long time. But let's say that you were going to team with some people that you knew, like me, you know, from your local shop, that type of thing. Would you have a conversation? Like, would you just say, Hey, do you want help during, like, would you just ask before yeah, the tournament? You might as well, you might as well talk or like set some ground rules, especially if you have a team together before, just to try to get a sense for it. And this is why playing the practice event helps because you can practice yeah. without, with stakes, but without the highest of stakes. Mm -hmm. uh, keep track of what all the matchups are. And this doesn't apply to Team Constructed at all because it doesn't matter. But in, in t limited, like, if I'm playing against Merfolk, you're probably not going to have to worry about one with the wind out of your Pirates opponent. They're just going to yeah. be in the Merfolk deck. That's right. Similarly, like, if you, you know, if some of the matches get started faster, and don't game this, don't do this on purpose, but... If I've had to take a mulligan and then the two matches next to me start and they're both playing aggro decks, I'm probably thinking like, okay, I might be playing against a control deck. So mm -hmm. 
it's good to know what colors people are, where the cards are split up. If someone plays a Wrath and it's like, well, this the person I'm playing this probably doesn't have a Wrath because their teammate has a Wrath, even though they're the same color. Yeah. You, you'll also see this. There, there's a more subtle hints that you can get about the type of cards your opponents can have. For example, you might be playing against, say, a red-white deck. You know, they're beating you down. They're, they're playing their Sky Terror or whatever. And <clears throat> you might come up to a spot where you're way, way ahead and you're asking yourself, but, you know, you, maybe you're – maybe not way ahead. Maybe you're significantly ahead, but you're in a tough spot. And you've got this thing thought out in your head where you're like, well, are they, what if they have settled the wreckage, right? Or or maybe Bright Reprisal, something like that where you're like, mm. And if you look over and you notice that, you know, you, your teammate or the person you're playing against has been playing a bunch of like heavy red deck with a little bit of white and not a lot of double white, like no double white spells, that kind of thing. And you look over and there's some, like you said, like a three color dinosaur control or a, you know, green white dinosaur, you know, whatever slow down style deck that clearly is the white deck of the, of the bunch. They just didn't want to play the sky terror. So they put a couple of extra cards in this other one. You can start to rule out certain types of cards, cards that, uh, have double white mana symbols become much less likely. And let's say this was a format where there was a card with a triple white, you know, like the Awakening Sun's Avatar or something like that. They don't have that. Like that, you have to put yourself in their seat. When they build the decks, they're not doing that, right? They're, they're going to say, this is our white deck, this is our red deck, but we're going to give it a little bit of white cards because we opened two Sky Terrors, you know, something like that. Yeah, and, and this all adds up. And if, you, if you're good at paying attention to that and letting your teammates know, then you, you could actually provide a very real service Especially like, I'm not going to play around combat tricks out of the green white vampires deck. Especially if the, the or the sorry, green white dinos deck, if the vampires deck just played a couple vampire zeals, yeah, they're just less likely to have it. Yeah, uh, sideboarding is a good time to ask for help, especially if your teammate knows what you're playing against or took some glances. Plus, you have uh, very tribal decks in this format, so sideboarding tends to be a little more cut and dry than I'm playing against green blue stuff. Mm -hmm. So. You can ask your teammates for help for sideboard. When your match ends, don't check out. Don't leave to go to the bathroom. Don't be like, oh, peace out. See you guys later. Uh, figure out which match is the highest match or highest value to focus on because instead of trying to watch both, just concentrate on one, especially if uh, one of the, one is more complicated or the person needs more help for whatever reason. I it's love It's a lot that. better to just tunnel on one. That's my That's my favorite part of the whole experience is either when I get to be that person or when somebody's watching me, because, you know, when I've played in uh, team drafts, this has happened, but also I did play in a team GP once. And um, I find that there's a, there's a really cool kind of push and pull around that, because if you get the person that's saying something every single turn, that's just annoying and not what you're signed up for. If you're just like, you know, if they're, they're commenting on every little play you're making and every little thing you've done, it's not right. And when I sit behind somebody, I just let them play. The only time when I'll talk is if I see something very obvious, like that needs to be said, or if they ask me. And I love having somebody sit there to watch every turn for five turns in a row. And then when I get to a really hard spot, I'll look at them and they know exactly what I'm going to ask, you know, and, and where we're at with it. And then we can have a little discussion to figure out what the play is. And that's the kind of thing that you can get as long as a person's there with you. It's really, really hard. I mean, Luis, you're, you're uniquely skilled at this and maybe not uniquely, but you know what I mean? There, there's other people that can do it too, but this is one of your big strengths is you have the ability to break down complex boards really fast. Like you can just sort of your snapshot and your autopilot is usually really good, but most people aren't. And if they just peep over at your thing and go, yeah, I don't know, just, yeah, attack with everything, you know, it, you have to really look at that and say, did you really think through what I'm thinking? Because look, if it was as simple as just, yeah, attack with everything, well, you probably would have done it already, right? So, uh, you know, I love that part that you're describing right now. <clears throat> and I think that it's really one of the most important things, but know your boundaries. Let your teammate play. You chose them for a reason. You're with them for a reason. Let them do their thing. And then when they need an, another opinion or if they're definitely going to make a mistake, then then go ahead and chime in. Exactly. And it, tr knowing when to strike that balance is really important. And that's where the practice part comes in because yeah. you're just, you're just so not going to get that walking in. Yeah. I feel like now like the practice part has gone up in value just through the course of this conversation. Oh, it really has because – ironing out those things is well, really, the, really critical. Dealing with a team is not as simple as like try to play three matches. It's try to communicate effectively with two other human beings and work together as a team. That's what's fun about these is figuring out how to do that. 
Yeah. And the interesting part is that as great as the upside of that is, the downside is too. It's frustrating. You oh, yeah. you may cross your wires, that kind of thing. Uh, when a teammate tells you to do something bad, like I, I had a team match where uh, Ifra leans over and asks a question and I and I hadn't really watched the match and I just kind of gave him like, oh, you should do this. He's like, are you sure? I'm like, yeah, that seems pretty good. And it ended up being the wrong play and cost us the match. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that felt bad. I was like, mm-hmm. wow, I screwed that one up bad. So mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> try not to do that. Um the last part, cheer your teammates on and be happy. Like it sounds like a platitude, but bad attitudes are contagious. And when you lose, you don't need all three people sitting around like looking at their phones and being like, Bleh. like yeah, you've got the whole rest of the tournament to play. And even if you don't, even if you're done now, go have fun. You did, you played a team tournament. That was sweet. So yeah, it, I, I like the expectations being reasonable as well. You yeah, know, like like when I played a GP, like expecting to get. First, and first, so second, I'm like very disappointed. Then you could be very disappointed. But for us normal human beings, <laughs> you know, you come in, let's say that you, you get two local players or two players from your local game store and they're pretty good. Like, you know, you, you fancy yourself one of the better players in the store and you grab two of the, the other better players in the store and you think, all right, well, we're pretty good. Well, you're probably not right at this level. Like we're talking about the Grand Prix level. There's going to be professional magic player teams, people that do this for a living. All that time that you spend at your job, they're playing magic and they're thinking about things and they've got their hypergeometric calculators out and they're <laughs> figuring everything out on spreadsheets and they're going to beat you most of the time, right? So you're probably better than the average team, but you're probably not as good as the, the best teams. And so coming in, well, what are your goals? right? What are your realistic goals? Obviously your goal should be to win the tournament. That's why you showed up to do it. That's why you're listening to this podcast and trying to improve your game. But what are your real, what, what would you be happy with? What would you be content with leaving? And you know, one of the big things that you can leave with is, well, we improved, right? We figured things more about this so that we can stay a team and go next time because you know who the best teams are? The ones that stick together. Like Peach Garden Oath has been the best team for a while and they haven't they've been on the same team for five plus years, you know, yep. and That's those guys have been strength. great. Yeah. When like you, Eric and Ben played, you guys had a long stretch there and you guys were insane, like easily in the top three teams. You, you know, for many of those tournaments, you were first, the team we mentioned before with Dave Williams, Matt Spirelli and Paul Rietzel, those guys play everything they can together. They love playing together and they're one of the best teams. And like you said, I mean, Dave Williams, he doesn't have like a stellar individual career. He has a respectable one, but nothing insane. Yet his team career is absurd. And it's not just because he goes and like gets these like dead ringers. He goes and gets really solid pros. Like Sperling and Rietzel are both, you know, solid players. Rietzel's in the Hall of Fame. He's excellent. You know, Sperling's a, a notch below, but he's a good yeah, player. Sperling is a very funny writer. Sure. Uh, <laughs> I'll have to take your word for that. But anyway, but you know, but he's, he's fine. You know, he's a, a good professional level player, but you know, that doesn't, I can name you 15 teams that have like a, you know, a hall of fame or near hall of fame level player with two like good pros, call them gold pros or whatever. Right. They don't win as much as these guys do, you know? And I think a lot of that is because they stuck together and they ground it through. I'm sure, you know, it took some figuring each other out, some feeling each other out, some, some role assignment. Hey, who are you on this team? And what is my job? And now they're great. And, you know, it really shows that there is a skill to this. Like I said, look at Dave Williams record. He's insane at team events, just absurd. He just, and and it's not just with those two guys, it's with other people too. Uh, There's a real skill to it, but I think you have to kind of let it marinate a little bit and, and, you know, get, get to that point where you're uh, comfortable with each other. So going to play a tournament, especially if you, if it's your first one, a good goal would be, let's have this go smoothly, right? Let's win as much as we can, but let's make sure that we're figuring out the boundaries and the roles uh, that we want to play on this team. And then, you know, you, you'll get better as it goes on. For sure. And you know, this might sound intimidating. Hopefully you broke it down to a point where you feel like maybe you could approach one of these. I really God, strongly I just urge you to try. Now, man. I just want to yeah, play like, one now. Even God. if there's like local sweet team events, just just play one. Team events are so fun. They are the most fun. So I, I don't think we should do this topic anymore. <laughs> yeah. Makes it just makes nice. me want to play. You know, I just, ah, it makes me want to play in one of these team events. I, I I had such a good time when I played that one. It was a while ago now. And every time we cover one, I'm so jealous because it's just like, this brings people out of the woodwork too, you know, oh, yeah. even, even people that don't really play that much, maybe they've moved on or they got a family now, a career, whatever it is that they're going on, they'll still, you know, dust off the the sleeves and, and come out and battle with their friends for these things. It makes me want to do it too. I do love covering them. They're also the most fun to cover. So I guess I get something out of it. Good. 
It's good stuff, man. Are you going to play any of these things? Yeah, I'm going to be playing at Grand Prix Indianapolis. There you go. I'm, I think I'm going to be covering that one. What, what's, the, what's the format? That's it limited. is uh, Rivals Ixalan Team Sealed. Nice. So that one's coming up. And then we mentioned the it's – uh, the, it's, it's like the, it's two weeks after Santa Clara or a week after Santa Clara. Yeah, it's like in mid to late January, right? Yep. Yeah. And then there's also uh, Santa Clara, which as we mentioned is is Team – trios so make sure you check that i'll actually put the link for that one in the in the show notes as well just because it is coming up in a few weeks so if you do want to play you need to start posting on your local message boards about finding a legacy player base basically just because i think those are the hardest one and then you also need a modern and a standard though i think those are much easier to find uh, by comparison and uh while you're there channelfireball.com they do sponsor the show i want to say thank you to them once again for their uh, continued support of limited resources they are a great company and we're very happy to be associated with them. Uh, you know, anything you need magic related, you know where to go. CFB, that's where you go. They give you free content. I mean, this is a website that that actually cares about their their customer base in that way. They're not going to charge you for it. They're going to say, look, if you want to be enthusiastic about magic, you want to learn more. And, you know, if you want to improve, I, that's the thing is that the the content is is definitely for people like you. Uh, you know, you, you come here to listen to limited resources. You're going to like the type of stuff you find there because it gives you this really cool angle of just basically sitting over the shoulder of some of the best players in the world as they play magic. You can pause it, right? You can, you can have a tough position come up in a match, pause it and say, okay, I am in this seat. I'm Reed Duke. What do I actually do? And you go, okay, my opponent has this. And you kind of work it through and you go, all right, this is what I would do. I block with this. I would use a removal here and then I'd pass the turn, hit play, see what Reed does. Right, that you just can't get that anywhere else. It's just incredible insight into uh, you know some of the greatest minds in the game, and it's all free on the front page of ChannelFireball.com. And uh, of course, if you need anything for the holidays, oh, now you know where to go. If you want to find us on social media, it's also easy to do. I'm Marshall underscore LR and Luis's LSV on basically everything. Um, we've both pretty active on a bunch of different content stuff. We both just love interacting with the community, uh, helping you improve its stuff and, and maybe even provide a little bit of entertainment along the way. Uh, I've got links to all of the stuff that Luis and I do over at LRcast.com, just right on the front page. So if you just want to find our stuff, it's just right there. Uh, Luis streams. He's going to stream right after we're done with this. Um, you can you can find his stream on twitch.tv slash LSV, right? That's yep. the easiest way. Yeah. And then, you know, like I've got my YouTube channel going MTG breakdown. I, I put up another one of the, uh, <clears throat> the breakdown rewinds. These are the ones where I sit with the player and do director's commentary. So, uh, over there, one of the important matches of their career. So you can see that I got another one of those coming out pretty soon. That well. they've lost usually. <laughs> uh, well, no, we, we did a winner. Last one was a winner. We were now uh, two losses was, and uh, one win. Randy, right? <laughs> yeah. We, Randy, Randy was the winner. Um, and then, uh, the next one is, I'm not going to tell you if it's a winner or a loss, but, uh, but it'll be coming out. Well, I've actually got two of those in the queue. Tell me what the match is. No, I'm not going to tell you. Oh, okay. It's, it'll be a secret, but it'll be out soon. I'm almost done editing it. And, uh, hopefully I get to keep making a bunch of those. I really enjoy it. Anyway, uh, you can find all that stuff on LRcast.com. Thanks so much for hanging out with us. We do appreciate it. Hopefully you have a good holidays and, uh, we'll see you next week. So I've actually been meaning to talk about this for a while, uh, because, what I'm going to talk about is a really funny way to do pack wars that we put a bunch of at the world championship. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. This is sweet. Yeah. So this is a, a perfect way to crack those extra packs. If you're, if you just have one other person to play with and some time to kill. It's By the way, this like, is Marshall approved. The, any yes. of these like pack warsy things, that's all I'm asking. You don't need yeah, to open up the packs. You're not saying do all just, eight, eight person draft. No. You're saying just, just use them for something. <laughs> yes. Just like it's all this extra value in a pack rather than just opening it up, seeing what the rare is and throwing away the commons or whatever. And this is a great example of it. Yes. This is a Pi Gao pack wars. Uh, basically what happens is you face against one other person. You each crack your pack, your booster pack. And then each player makes four different pairs of cards. Mm -hmm. So uh, what, what that trios of cards, right? Yes. Yeah. Sorry, four, four different trios of cards. Uh, of so you're using up twelve cards, and then you don't you don't have to use the rest. So you use up twelve cards out of the pack. What you're trying to do is each of those hands, each of those three card hands, plays against the opponent, and one of their hands. And the rules are: you have infinite mana. <clears throat> and you start with all the cards in your hand. So let me give you an example. Uh, 
you open a pack of Ixalan, and one of the one of the the, the trios you make is you make Jungle Delver mm-hmm. plus uh, Cobbled Wings plus it doesn't matter what the third card is. Yeah, that's a, that's and a you, sweet combo. And your plan is to play Cobbled Wings on Jungle Delver and attack them for infinite damage. On the other hand, a different trio might be like Contract Killing, you know, a random like Prosperous Pirates and a Vampire Zeal. So you get to kill one creature that they have, and you get to potentially. Uh, Win a combat with Vampire Zeal and hope that your Prosperous Pirates is enough to, to beat them when the dust is settled. Exactly, yeah. What's tricky is sometimes you won't get enough cards that can win a bunch of different uh, games. So you'll have to have some piles that are incapable of winning. <laughs> yes. And just because you, you randomly determine each one plays against one of the opponents at random. Yeah, and then you play out all of them. And you play out all of them. And so if it's 2 2, it's tied. And if it's 3 1, uh, or you know four zero or whatever, then that person wins. Usually, you just play for all the cards. Yeah, and then that, and then you just win both packs worth. You can do it however you want with that, but that's yeah. what we usually do because you got to. I don't know. I, I find playing for something is so much more fun, even if it's just a random rare or whatever. And it's a ton of fun because you have to try to like decide like the jungle delver. Like sometimes jungle delver is just enough by itself. It's an infinite infinite. So you're like, mm-hmm. okay, I don't really need to stack anything else there. But sometimes you're like, oh, should I put a removal spell in this pile or this pile? Or you you find sweet combinations and you're trying to like end up in a spot where uh, you combine like Tempest Color plus uh, Siren's Ruse to blink and tap all their creatures twice. So you just need a, a way to kill them outside of that. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of pretty sweet stuff going on. Counter spells. Yeah, counter spells. Uh, again, combat tricks, removal. So it's a lot of fun. And uh, Chion just beat the crap out of me. He beat me like five times in a row. <laughs> yeah. So it, it's a very clearly luck-based format from what I can tell. <laughs> but I would recommend it. It's a good way to use up packs. It spices up your pack war. And uh, if it gives you a thirst to go play Pagan at a casino, that is definitely not our fault. <laughs> <laughs>